Hi, uh, thanks for coming this evening. I'm Dr. Gershon with the Aspen Institute for Anti-Aging and Regenerative Medicine. And uh, we're gonna talk about a few things tonight that I'm really excited about. Some things that have caused me uh, actually about 14 years ago to change the scope of, of my practice. My background is sports medicine. I've been a doctor at the division one college level for 25 years, Olympic level two or three times and I'm passionate about helping patients feel better. And some of you may have noticed that our title in the ad in the paper for the seminar last week was about better sex, more energy, and weight loss. Well, those are things that get people's attention that we all address as we get older or want to address. It's like, what happened? <laughs> I need more energy. Some things aren't working the way they were. And we all want to be trimmer and, and be fit. And I've preached diet and exercise for 35 years. And as I became an aging athlete 13 years ago when I turned 50, I decided I wasn't gonna take it sitting down. And so I really began the study of anti-aging, regenerative medicine, hormone therapy. And so what I wanna share with you tonight are things that address those key points that, we, that you may have seen, <clears throat> better sex, more energy, and weight loss. But it really, I titled this The Truth About Aging for Men and Women because something's going on and we feel it and we know it and we just kind of you know, think, well, that's the way it is. You know, I'm, I'm just aging and I guess I have to deal with this. But the reality is that's not the case. And, and so I want to point out for you the importances of balancing hormones, the things that we see. Uh, with patients, with all of us as we age, changes biochemically, what we can do about it, why they're important, and what the consequences are really if we don't deal with it. Uh, because it's very scientific and it's something that we can do that is safe. I'm also gonna dispel some of the myths about hormone therapy that you've heard, that I heard as a physician before I really dug in and studied and learned the truth about aging men and women. So. Um, Compared, and I'll just ask you some questions, compared to 10, 20 years ago, is your energy level lower? Are you weaker? Is your memory worse? Are you losing stamina? Um, is your sex life not what it used to be? Do you have more wrinkles? Do you have a spare tire that wasn't there in, in your youth? And, uh, you know, do you seem like you're just more susceptible to illness, <clears throat> chronic health problems. And so a number of things, as we think about how our health has progressed, are tied to our hormone balance and, and just very important for us to identify. So what are hormones? So we're gonna talk about a couple things tonight. <clears throat> so I'm gonna share this for men and women. I'm gonna talk about testosterone replacement in men. What's the controversy, if there is any, and, and women, sex hormone replacement in, in women. What, again, is the controversy? And we know that there were some things that have uh, came out in the past, back in 2002, that changed the way that we looked at this forever, and we're still fighting that, and which are some very poorly designed studies um, with some factors that you need to know the truth about. And then, <clears throat> I wanna start with, we understand, so in order to understand hormones, we think about our, our nervous system. If you know what the picture on the right is, it's an old switchboard. When people had party line phones, and they made a phone call and somebody plugged it in. So our nervous system's kinda of like that switchboard. Our brain tells our finger to move by a hardwired nervous system. Okay, it's very important, we couldn't live without it. But our hormone system is like a wireless network. Okay, our hypothalamus in the brain controls this wire, wireless network and it's essential for communication between our cells. And so these hormones are biochemical messengers that turn on and off cell functions <clears throat> and help regulate a gene expression. So they're critical. And so as we have um, loss of hormones with aging, and we see it at all levels, as early as 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond. And our cells can't communicate. They don't talk to each other properly because we're, our wireless network is broken, so to speak. So I just say that to help put it in perspective for you. Hormone effects, you know, we have many effects. Obviously, growth, the immune system, they're anti-inflammatory. <clears throat> they affect our metabolism and mood. 
<coughs> excuse me, to help prepare us for new phases in life, obviously reproduction. So they have many, many activities. Optimal hormone levels occurred in our youth, in our 20s to 30s, and then they slowly start to decline. And they say over the next 15 to 20 years, which is true, but they decline at the rate of about one to 3% a year, sometimes more. So by the time someone's 30, 40, they can be off a long ways. It's a linear progression. I see more and more uh, patients in their 30s than I ever did 10 or 15 years ago. There are a lot of environmental factors that we can also discuss that may be part of that, but they're essential. And so uh, we want and we know that we can optimize, return us to more youthful function by going back to those levels that we had in our 20s and 30s. And, and as we noticed, during that time, if you think about it, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sick, but there are not many sick 20 or 30 year olds. And so the reason for that is that that's when our hormones are at our very best. So as hormones decline, we age more rapidly. Our biologic age is intimately tied to the health of your endocrine system. So hormonal decline has negative consequences on aging, increasing your likelihood of death and premature aging. So from nature's perspective, you know, a species lives long enough to reproduce, populate that species. And afterwards it becomes a burden on the system, hormones decline, and that species goes through its life cycle and dies. Well, that's nature's perspective. We know, however, that humans are living longer and longer than really ever anticipated. If you look back to prehistoric and Roman times, you were lucky to make it to 30 or 40. And then as we have moved into the 1900s, that lifespan just continues to move up into the 20s, you know, 80s, 90s and beyond. My father just retired from med medical practice after 64 years, he's 92, still going strong, still feeling great. So we're seeing more and more centigenarians as we age from a number of factors of better medical care, obviously hormonal balancing. And we predict that those life uh, spans will continue to uh, progress into the 100s, 110s, 120s over the next uh, several decades. So the neuroendocrine theory of aging is that we age because our hormones decline. And I, I would buy into that. I would agree with that. So are we fooling mother nature when we replenish our hormones? I hope so. <laughs> and I'll show you why. So if you, what I want to point out are some things that really changed our thinkings on hormones. So there was a time in the 80s, 90s, when there were many large studies that showed all the numerous health benefits for hormone replacement. Heart disease, cancer, osteoporosis, uh, protection from that, Alzheimer's disease. Then in 2002, and I remember it well, the world was basically just turned upside down. I know at that time, I just stopped writing prescriptions. I, there was no way I was gonna write a prescription for Prempro or Progestin, Premarin, um, synthetic estrogen, and 50% of all women taking hormones at that time were stopped abruptly. Why? Well, this study came out that showed all these negative effects and every doctor in the country ran to the hills worrying about malpractice suits because of this study. And this study was a very flawed study. There are some factors in it that are real and true and we'll point that out. But we have to remember as I go through it, it was about synthetic hormones, not bioidentical hormones, not natural hormones, which duplicate uh, your natural hormones that you've had your whole life, both for men and women. So, um, so this is what happened in 2002. So the World Health Initiative study contradicted several previous well-respected studies. And so what, what do we believe or do? Is it possible they're all correct? Well, the answer was in study design and, and, uh, and really uh, the patient selection as well. So Women's Health Initiative was to assess the benefits of hormone replacement, hormone replacement being estrogen and progesterone, product called PremPro, and that's not 
progesterone, which we use now, which is bioidentical. Progestin is a synthetic compound, and so is uh, the premarin, uh, the estrogen and premarin. And then uh, ERT was estrogen only, premarin only. <clears throat> the average age in that study was 63 years of age. Most had pre-existing risk factors. Over 60% were obese or overweight. 10% had known pre-existing coronary artery disease, and half had many other risk factors. And so the World Health Initiative conclusions were that, that if you took Premarin or PremPro, you were at increased risk for heart attack, stroke, invasive breast cancer, blood clots in the lung or pulmonary emboli, deep venous thrombosis, and that it decreased the risk for osteoporosis, fractures, and colon cancer. Well, that's a good thing, but I don't know that it was worth it to risk all the other factors. So most doctors stopped prescribing, women stopped taking their hormones, and then started that rapid steady state of decline that we call menopause and, and aging. And so that's very unfortunate. So I'm going to show what uh, we've learned since then is that the trial recommendations were that the, they said the risk outweigh the benefits long term it's not for primary prevention and you should only use it for menopausal symptoms the lowest dose possible for the shortest time well that's a safety net you know that was just a way out to say well we can do something but we're afraid to do anything long term because of those negative effects with synthetic hormones and so uh, heart disease, hormone replacement, and coronary artery, uh, artery disease. We know that the number one killer of women over 50 is a heart attack. Well, why is that? Because you need estrogen. Without estrogen and menopause, we rapidly develop very uh, stiff arteries and increases risk of heart attack and actually stroke as well. So we know there's a lot of negatives. Then there are four other studies that showed evaluating heart disease with estrogen started at menopause, started early, and all of those studies showed an improvement in coronary vascular, uh, cerebral, uh, excuse me, coronary vascular disease and a cerebral vascular accident with early administration, and that it prevents but doesn't treat heart disease. Well, we know that. So, so again, it showed there are benefits to early replacement of estrogen. Also, Alzheimer's disease, that in patients on hormone replacement therapy, there was a 50% reduction in the incidence of Alzheimer's, particularly if it was started uh, within uh, 10 years of menopause, and a five-fold lower incidence of Alzheimer's disease, and that it, it was not effective uh, in treatment of any patient with established Alzheimer's. So this is interesting to know, and they say it should be started right at menopause and continued indefinitely. So we have some contradictory information. Stroke, we know that it significantly uh, improves cognition in younger postmenopausal women within five years of menopause. And so um, there's a really crucial period right postmenopausal, in my opinion, perimenopause and postmenopausal, that uh, has tremendous protective uh, effects. So for stroke, cancer, progestin in PremPro, progestin is synthetic progesterone, not bioidentical progesterone. It's progestin. It's not the same molecule. molecule. It's mitotic. In other words, it increases uh, cell division. It causes blood clots, prothrombotic, which is why... Uh, the progestin components in birth control, why there's uh, increased risk of, of blood clot and DVT, deep venous thrombosis with um, birth control pills from the progestin component, still dangerous. Um, and adding progestin to estrogen increased the risk of breast cancer by almost 30% over baseline. And it, uh, so, you know, really significant. And the, again, the important thing to understand is it is not progesterone. So the World Health Study did show with osteoporosis, they didn't evaluate younger women or from the prevention point of menopause, but as far as osteoporosis, overall hip fractures were reduced by 35% and 24% in other fractures. And so although it was very negative effects on cardiovascular disease, cancer, stroke, uh, blood clots, there were benefits 
to, to patients with significant uh, osteoporosis. Yep. Other observations, they th saw a 35% reduction in new onset diabetes and 60% reduction, and this is a real problem for many aging women, in recurrent urinary tract infections. And so you, the estrogen, even though the synthetic estrogen was not healthy for many uh, factors, including breast cancer, that it did at least help significantly reduce the incidence of um, urinary tract infection. So estrogen deficiency, we know, this is a long list. It's like if we know that it contributes to this, why wouldn't you want to do something about it? So heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, colon cancer, osteoporosis, vaginal atrophy, hot flashes, macular degeneration, depression and mood swings, sexual dysfunction, atrophy of the skin, certainly sleep disturbances, uh, tooth loss, decreased sense of well-being, and just an overall decreased quality of life. So. That's a long, significant list. I don't think anyone, man or woman, looking at that list would say, oh yeah, sign me up for that. That sounds great. You know, I'm just gonna take aging as it gets there. Well, we, you know, we fortunately can do some things about this. So the benefits are, and I say it says the potential benefits, I'll, I'll tell you that, that I haven't seen anyone that does, can't have these benefits when we optimize levels scientifically with established protocols and reach specific ranges in our blood work is improved sexual response, increased energy and vitality, improved mood and sense of well-being, relieves hot flashes, night sweats, insomnia, and it says wake up to sex at 50. You know, no reason that, that we can't be as vibrant as we were at 20, 30, and really any age and just restore our relationships. So what's a woman to do? You certainly don't like to list all the negatives, <clears throat> certainly don't want to accept the status quo, but gee, there was this study in 2002 that may or may not have been flawed that was only on synthetic hormones that my doctor won't prescribe this for me. And unfortunately, we, a lot of us have just had our heads in the sand when it comes to addressing this because we are just shook up the world of medicine. But... I pointed out to you the flaws in the study and the way that it was done and the fact that it was not on natural bioidentical hormones. It was on synthetic hormones only. And so what are we to do? Well, I've preached healthy lifestyle, diet, and exercise, stress management for 35 years in practice. And, and so we know that if we're going to do hormone therapy, particularly over age 60, that we just use caution, that we screen for pre-existing disease, breast cancer, cerebrovascular disease, smoking, overweight, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, the kind of risk factors that are modifiable, and then you know, treat. So as, as our hormones decline, you know, we have some changes. Age happens to everyone, but age-related decline is optimal. So our hormone decline is really at the root of many age-related diseases and hormone replacement therapy can be safe and beneficial from, for most women. <clears throat> so it's worth sitting down, reviewing blood work, seeing where levels are, and really understanding the benefits and the differences between bioidentical hormones and synthetic hormones. And there are many, many, many studies out that show that back that up that show those benefits and i've been practicing this i'm board certified besides my sports medicine background in anti-aging and regenerative medicine and i can tell you that i've seen life-changing effects from hormone balancing it's been one of the most rewarding things that i've ever done for patients so i want to change gears a little bit <clears throat> i wanted to point out the pros and cons for women and i want to go ahead and talk about hormone therapy for men because who would have thought, okay? You know, we all know that something's happening and we go through rapid, de uh, uh, gradual decline and then women kind of fall off the cliff when menopause happens. And, you know, grumpy old men aren't just that way because they <laughs> choose to be grumpy old men. It starts at age 30, losing one to 3% of our hormones a year, gradually and linear, there's kind of no cliff, it's just a steady downhill slide. And so I want to talk about some things um, 
that are very important to understand about the many, many benefits of hormone restoration for men. So by whatever name we call it, andropause, testosterone insufficiency or deficiency, Adam syndrome, androgen deficiency of men, male menopause, got lots of names. It's the short term is grumpy old man. And, and I'm really kidding because this starts very young. You know, when I started doing this almost 14 years ago for patients and myself, the average age was 45. I would see 45 to 50 year olds and rarely someone in their 30. I have dozens of 30 year olds now. And I think there really is an epidemic related to plastic water bottles, BPA compounds, estrogenic compounds that we're bombarded with that we don't even think about. So I see more and more and more young men every year than I ever did before. So I'm gonna go through this so you understand it because if you have a man in your life that you love, you need to get him tested and we have great deals for that. So let me just talk about it. So this testosterone declines by one to actually 3% a year, starting in your 30s. And so by the time a man's 80, you know, you're only a fifth of your youthful level. This is really the heart of andropause. And I have men in their 80s. My oldest is 88. Uh, he's very physically active. I have an 80-year-old that won the uphill race at Telluride last summer. And, you know, his testosterone level's 1,000 all day, every day. And he feels amazing. So just because these numbers are real and what's happening physiologically and what Mother Nature had planned to end the species and our lifespan, we don't have to accept that. So the causes are many. It can be primary, secondary, and it can be from metabolic conversion. <clears throat> we'll talk about that a little bit later because as we see metabolic syndrome and obesity, as men get lower testosterone and more and more abdominal fat, what's left converts in fatty tissue, it's called aromatization, it converts into estrogen. And they may have too much sex hormone binding globulin, so whatever testosterone they have left can't be physically active, it's bound to protein. And so the free testosterone is actually a very low number. And so we wanna optimize that, and we're gonna talk about that. So symptoms are many. You know, when female patients present to the office, it's mood, irritability, you know, things are changing, hot flashes, weakness, weight gain, muscle mass. Guys don't talk about that so easy. And so they haven't been as quick to come in and discuss these kind of things. But the symptoms are many. Fatigue, redu reduced stamina, loss of strength, lower libido, loss of erectile function, uh, just a decreased sense of well-being. I joked about the grumpy old men, but that's kind of where it is. Just you don't feel right and you're irritable. And so changes in sleep patterns, cognition, mental function and focus is very intimately tied to our hormone levels. Um, other signs are increasing body fat, insulin resistance and, and progression of uh, early onset diabetes. Bone loss, men can also have osteoporosis without adequate hormone levels, bone demineralization uh, can occur, depression and infertility at younger ages. And so um, there's a lot of misinformation about heart disease. And you know, a couple studies come out, poorly designed or not, and the media picks it up and runs with it. Oh, testosterone is so bad for your heart, it causes this or this problem. I, I just want you to know these slides will show you there are many, many benefits for in cardiovascular disease. The heart has more testosterone receptors than any organ in the body. Strengthens the heart muscle, helps lower low density cholesterol and total cholesterol may improve arrhythmias in angina and may prevent blood clots. Low testosterone definitely increases abdominal fat, cholesterol, triglycerides, blood pressure, estrogen, a bad uh, cholesterol, lipoprotein A, and your insulin levels and decreases coronary artery elasticity as estrogen does in women and testosterone for women. One of the reasons we see increasing risk of heart attack and stroke from loss of the elasticity of, of the vascular system. 
in chronic heart failure, and I've seen patients <clears throat> respond well with testosterone treatment to helping their heart failure because it improves the physical pump function of the heart. So it can improve anabolic function, arterial dilatation, cardiac output because the muscle is contracting stronger, has anti-inflammatory effects, and of course improves mood scores. Um, so low testosterone and stroke risk is related again to those kind of vascular changes that I mentioned, what we call the intima media thickening, the lining of the vascular system and arteries. So there's greater progression of that thickening with low testosterone. And, and this is just a you know, picture of a stroke and what can happen with the common carotid artery is that it gets uh, stiff. So what is glycation? Low testosterone and glycation. This is really important from my perspective and some new studies have actually come out and shown that glycation is a much bigger risk factor for heart attack than cholesterol ever was. That in the 35 years since the Framingham study, there's been zero, zero percentage change in the cardiovascular mortality rate with the onset of even a billion dollar statin industry. It has done nothing. Taking statins, Crestor, Lipitor has done zero to change the overall death rate from cardiovascular disease, and that glycation is the real culprit. So what is glycation? Glycation is sugar coating of your protein. So elevated blood sugar, think about those snacks tonight before you go to bed, that, that sugar coating of your proteins is what makes them sticky Lower testosterone increases the rate of glycation, may uh, cause elevated hemoglobin A1c, 60-day blood sugar averages. And, and in those patients they, with elevated A1c's, we know they have lower testosterone levels. And we have seen changes in not only body fat and distribution, but in this rate of glycation, stickiness of their proteins, then it binds to the fat molecules that are there and accelerates heart disease or atherosclerosis. So uh, prostate cancer, let me go back to that. Prostate cancer risk, that's one I hear from men all the time. Well, it affects one in 80 of us, one in 20 will die. It's the second most fatal cancer in men, but we know that there's no, not only no correlation between testosterone and PSA, that the highest free testosterone rates have been linked to the lowest risk of prostate cancer. So there's been studies done at the VA with elderly men, and, and there's many studies that back this up and show it. So when I hear, you know, there's many wives' tales related to the previous study with women of, oh, hormones cause cancer. Well, specific ones do. Oh, testosterone causes prostate cancer. Well, those myths are dispelled with knowledge and with understanding this. So we have many studies that can uh, verify that. So low testosterone and obesity. We see a growing number of patients with metabolic syndrome, and we all wanna help prevent that, prevent the onset of diabetes, decreased tissue insulin, or increasing insulin resistance. Um, so has anybody thought about testosterone? No, it's diet, exercise, don't eat sugar. Well, there's a reason, and the basis for it is low testosterone. Obese men have lower testosterone, and higher estrogen. We've already mentioned that, and it's proven that what little is left converts to estrogen. So when we replace testosterone, we use estrogen blockers to stop that process so that we can have the benefits of optimal testosterone levels. Fat cells convert testosterone to estrogen, abdominal obesity, if you don't know, we know that it increases cardiovascular risk, type two diabetes, and cancer, many cancers. What about cognitive function? This is not what guys like to talk about. This is what I joke about with grumpy old men, but cognitive function is very important. Mental fog, clarity, motivation, you know, lack of, of that vigor and that men have when their testosterone's at its peak and at optimal levels. And so we know by uh, many scoring systems in psychiatry, um, that the effects of low testosterone, one, loss of ability to concentrate, moodiness, emotionality, touchiness, irritability, 
timid, timidity, feeling weak, kind of unrest. You know, there's just a long list, general uh, passive attitudes, tiredness, just don't feel right, maybe even a little hypochondriac, uh, chondria, where everything's wrong with me kind of things. We just can't get sometimes a handle on it, but it's very explainable, and I've seen all of these symptoms improve significantly with testosterone therapy in men. So, low testosterone correlates with symptoms of depression. Testosterone replacement improves depression scores, fatigue, and libido. Here's a two-edged sword. We know that libido is lowered with uh, low testosterone, and antidepressants to treat depression do what? Prescription antidepressants diminish libido and sexual function and testosterone replacement can enhance it. So would you rather take vitamin P, Prozac, or physiologically restore your levels to youthful states and have these things improve? And so uh, to me, that's a big deal. Cognitive function, we kind of mentioned and talked about, very important for brain health um, to have adequate hormone levels. Remember your chemical messengers and so um, it contribute to memory impairment, uh, Alzheimer's disease, and it may increase the brain vulnerability to Alzheimer's. So the perception is one thing. We all think we still feel great and look great. The reality can be another, <laughs> but the possibilities uh, are significant. At any age, you're never too old to build muscle mass turn around the process of insulin resistance, change body composition, fat storage, overall glycation. I would say in every patient I've treated with testosterone, both male and female, that glycation has improved, that blood, I've had many diabetic patients reduce the amount of uh, medication that they've taken for their diabetes and or stop taking medicine. And so why? Because things are working at that biochemical level that we talked about. So with aging, uh, we know that body protein is built by testosterone and broken down by cortisol. So there is an inverse relationship. As we age and our testosterone levels decline, our cortisol levels increase. As we replenish that, there's an inverse relationship and it suppresses negative hormones as we improve testosterone. So normally during agents, uh, aging, we have decreasing free testosterone increasing cortisol. And, and as I mentioned, that low uh, testosterone further adds to excess cortisol because that feedback mechanism now is gone. And now cortisol dominates. It's a very negative catabolic hormone, your stress hormone, adrenaline. We don't need more of that. We know we don't need more stress. We certainly don't need more and more uh, cortisol. And so we see those uh, very, uh, very closely related. So excess cortisol uh, causes immune dysfunction, brain cell injury, arterial wall damage, uh, loss of bone density, and further suppression of testosterone and growth hormone production. Testosterone administration helps to uh, stop the overproduction of cortisol. So this is a, a test. This woman says she's screening for andropause. You don't look like the skinny kid I married 25 years ago. Well, so she's going to check his DNA. Well, we do a number of things. We can check your DNA if you like, but it's probably more important to check your free and total testosterone, the estradiol level, dihydrotestosterone, number of things. This isn't uh, just what's my testosterone, it's how much is physically active, how much do all the hormones interact? Free uh, T3 or uh, thyroid hormone, you know, very important that we look at every single uh, hormone, how they interact together, and then optimize all of them. And so how else can we increase it? Well, I told you I've been preaching diet and exercise my whole career, so get off your butt, exercise, get off that high fat, high sugar diet. Healthy fats are okay, we know. Stress management is a big deal and help to reduce body fat. But just how much does that really work? We're already trying that. I can assure you without adequate levels of testosterone, you're not gonna win this battle. So how do we take testosterone? 
There's numerous ways, injections, oral, pellets, patches, creams, gels, all is not created equal. There are forms that I never use uh, because of uh, complications. Some are pretty simple, self-injection. I don't use oral testosterone. The sub subcutaneous pellets work great. And I rarely use creams and gels because of conversion to dihydrotestosterone, which causes hair loss and prostate issues. And most people don't want to do that. And I don't like to deal with complications. So that's something that's personal, develops uh, patient to patient, uh, personal preference and what works best. So I have my thoughts and recommendations for men but we have to match it for each person because what works for one may not work for another. And we can reach by almost any method optimal levels. So side effects of testosterone. I'll just tell you that if we monitor this closely and we do blood work every three months, keep the levels where we want them, I rarely see any issues. So if it were not monitored and you just bought this off the internet or got an injection once in a while from someone, you would see some, could see some significant issues. And so uh, you can read those and look through them. I just, I don't see that much because we have methods to deal with all of it. So why, how does it work and how do we make sure that this is a health builder and not a health uh, detriment? Because we monitor regularly, we do blood levels, we measure free and total testosterone. We make sure that estradiol levels are not elevated. We don't even go to elevated DHT levels because we avoid products that do that. Um, PSA, of course, there's a great deal of uh, discussion and uh, controversy over whether it's even worth, worth testing PSA anymore. Um, and then physical changes. So the benefits, I believe, are many. Um, they help protect against abdominal obesity, muscle wasting, osteoporosis, inflammatory rated, uh, related syndromes in men and women. Testosterone helps to suppress inflammation. We look at uh, markers of inflammation in the blood annually to see that they're declining or stable, not increasing. And that happens with optimal levels. Um, and so aches, pains, unrelated and unexplained joint pain, those things are much, are very much related uh, to low hormone levels, specifically low testosterone. And a variety of cardiovascular diseases, Alzheimer's, depression, cognitive decline, type two diabetes, as I mentioned, and sexual dysfunction, all of this in men and women. And so we're talking about men right now, but the benefits are the same for men and women. Um, reported experience of men on testosterone. Increased energy, muscle strength, increased sexual desire or libido, improvement in high density cholesterol, improved bone density, decreased body fat, blood pressure, bad or LDL cholesterol and heart disease, improved sexual function, mood and blood glucose levels who would not want that list versus the list, the longer list of complications and problems from lack of, of proper hormone therapy. And so um, I think it's just really important that we look at these things and relate it to your quality of life. This is a picture of Bob Delmontique, Muscle and Fitness Magazine back in the 40s and 50s, uh, probably the original fitness guy to the stars. This is his pictures at 17 67 and 80 on the right hand side of the screen. Pretty, pretty amazing. As I said, you're never too old to build muscle mass. This was Bob at 80. He died in his mid eighties a few years ago, but the quality of his life, you know, none of us are going to live forever. And so with hormone therapy, age management medicine, our goal is to elevate and extend that curve. And so we live better longer. That's the motto of, of our practice in our clinic. And so we know that's possible and we've helped a lot of patients. It's very rewarding. And uh, I hope that you'll give us a call, call for a free consultation. The number's on the screen. And uh, I certainly appreciate you being here tonight. And if you're home or on the internet watching, thank you. And we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. All right, you have a question? Okay. Um, can you tell me a couple of things? What are the bioidentical hormones made from? 
actually um, derived from yams, from sweet potatoes. So um, they're a natural plant product that matches exactly your, your hormone levels. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, much of it can be genetic, and but things like as as our total testosterone declines and it converts more to estrogen, and elevated levels of DHT dihydrotestosterone would be, you know, more uh, indicative of that, and low thyroid because as we see, if you remember that's way um, way underdiagnosed is is subclinical hypothyroidism, which is why we measure free T3 and not just total T3 or say, gee, your TSH looks fine, but it doesn't matter. We want to know how much is bioavailable bio and active in your body. And so uh, actually low thyroid is probably even more tied to hair loss than the testosterone. Mm -hmm. So, but thank you. Does skin elasticity improve with testosterone? Does skin elasticity improve with testosterone? Skin elasticity improves with hormone therapy across the board, really, because we, uh, particularly women note it with estrogen from uh, facial skin, uh, arms, and, and uh, in sexual ways as well, because it improves circulation, it improves elasticity, and, and yeah, I would say in general, yes, that it does. And we also measure growth hormone. You know, not gr growth hormone is not for everyone, but it is for many. And, uh, and it definitely affects elasticity significantly. So, thanks. Yes? Can you talk a little bit about um, estrogen that we get from outside sources that's not healthy? Like I know you mentioned plastic water bottles. Can you like tell us a little bit more about that? Well, I actually have some good resources for that as well. The question was, to discuss a little about estrogen that comes from outside sources and what effects that can have. That would really be more geared towards negative effects right. for men. And so, uh, you know, it, it, you just have to understand that BPA, that some of the compounds in plastic are actually estrogenic and plastics in containers in almost everything we come in contact with. And so eliminating plastics, water bottles, uh, containers that your food is, it leaches into foods, particularly if microwaving, you know, styrofoam. It's gonna be with you in your body for as long as you live. And, and it's, it, so it just leaches in, particularly when substances are heated. If you got a case of water bottles in the car, it's summer and it's 100 degrees in there, you know, I would throw it away. I, I wouldn't drink it and, and I would get, I would just stop using bottled water and get a nice water filtration system, even the kind you just put in the fridge. There's some really good ones that you know, are safe and, and help to do that. Probably the best is a commercial water filtration system using stainless steel refillable bottles. So when you talk about that can cause depression in men? Well, not so much just the estrogenic compounds, but elevated estrogen levels and low testosterone. Yes, for sure, uh, more re and related to progesterone, which is kind of the feel-good hormone. We prescribe progesterone to help uh, counteract and balance the ratio of for breast health. When we replenish estrogen, we would never do it without giving progesterone because the unopposed estrogen activity can be negative uh, for breast tissue and cause increased uh, incidence of proliferation of breast tissue but it all affects mood. So estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, definitely mood and motivation for, for women as well. Okay. So thank you. All right, well, thank you. Thank you. See you later. <laughs>